Hare Krishna, everyone. This is Achyuta Bhava from Nightlight Astrology, and today is Bhakti Wednesday. So I am going to be reading you guys a story that really um, deeply touched me uh, that I read recently. Uh, it's by an author named John Moriarty, and uh, it comes from a book that I highly recommend you check out if you are the reading type. It's called A Hut at the Edge of the Village. Um, there is a story in here in this book called in that divine darkness the fishing was good this is about a 10 page story so what i recommend for today is that you find a comfortable position maybe sitting or lying down where you can listen and get absorbed into the story uh probably not as good a talk to be multitasking or listening to while there's lots of other things going on because I think the real takeaway comes when you get deeply absorbed into this particular story. It's a short story. After the story is <clears throat> over, I'm going to offer just a few thoughts. Not many, because I think the story speaks for itself. But a few thoughts as to why I chose this story, and just a few simple things about what this story meant to me when I first read it. So I hope that you will... Uh, enjoy this and also pick up a copy of A Hut at the Edge of the Village by John Moriarty if you like it. So this is called In That Divine Darkness, The Fishing Was Good. Big Mike, he was called, and ever since he came home to the island, after 30 years at sea, people felt there something inwardly torn or broken about him. He's had a rough crossing somewhere. By nightfall, on the day of his arrival, everyone knew he was back. Everyone who saw it was glad to see smoke from the old chimney. After a couple of days, anyone who hadn't seen him looked forward to meeting him on Sunday after Mass. He didn't show up. Neither was there sight or light of him the following Sunday. One thing, and that a big thing, they knew about him now. He wasn't rowing in behind Christ. Sarah Coyne didn't like it. Not that Sarah was pious. As midwife on the island, Sarah had helped to bring him into the world, and if only for the sake of his dead father and his dead mother, she wanted to hear that he'd fared fairly well in the world. One night, her curiosity getting the better other, <clears throat> she went up to see him. Jesus, Mary and Joseph, she said to Jim Barlow an hour or so later in her own house. Jesus, Mary and Joseph. He has, and yet he hasn't come back. He is still out there somewhere in the roaring forties of the sea, or in the roaring forties of his mind, out where the sound of the last foghorn and the life of the last lighthouse cannot reach him. Trying to throw a lifeline to him, she was the next day when she sent him a loaf of homemade brown bread and a jar of gooseberry jam neatly labeled and dated. Look at the brains of sheep and fish, Marcus King said to Sarah one day. You've seen them, haven't you? You've seen how furled they are. That's what's happened to him, Sarah. He unfurled too much of his mind to the wind. He let out too much sail to the wind. No, Sarah, no. We aren't keeled for those waters. We aren't keeled for the waters Big Mike was blown into. Walking home from Mass that Sunday with Sarah, Marcus was a strong, able man. Little did he or she suspect that within a year he'd be passing within a year he'd be passing the same house, Lavelle's house, Burke's house, Coyne's house, his own house, in a coffin. On the night after the funeral, lying awake in bed, Ned Lavelle was wondering who now would man the beam oars in his eight oar cura. Big Mike was the only prospect. One day, making a breast of it, he asked him. That evening, there was the sound of other footsteps, footsteps the women hadn't heard before on the gravel path going down to the sea. Coming to their doors, they wished him well. Something in him evoked a need in them. The need Sarah Coyne had felt when she sent him up the loaf of homemade brown bread and the pot of gooseberry jam. As was their custom, <clears throat> they waited to watch the curras going out, Seventeen of them out wide around the breakers, out around the headland into the ocean. Next morning at daybreak, they would, once again, be standing in their doors, counting them, more anxiously this time, as they came into view around the headland. 
That was the pattern of island life, the sound of footsteps, in ones and twos and threes, going down to the sea every evening, coming back every morning. <clears throat> Within a year, Big Mike had fallen in with all the old ways of his people. Outwardly, there was nothing odd or different about him. He even showed up at mass a few times, and yet he was strange. Sometimes in May, hauling their pots, fishermen in these waters would find a pale, delicately blue lobster. He, they would tell you, was a stray. He had come up from the limestone sea floors to the south. Down there, his coloring camouflaged him. Up here on a seafloor of granite and schist, he stood out. And so somehow did Big Mike. Things he would sometimes say in the course of an ordinary conversation didn't blend with local opinion. They didn't have the color of the recognized sacred tradition. <clears throat> Sarah Coyne would give anything to know. She went to see him one Sunday night, and she asked him straight out, did he or didn't he believe in God? I do, he said. I believe in God. But I also believe in something deeper than God, something more divine than God. Backing away from the awful sincerity of the man, Sarah didn't ask him the further question that had come to mind. She didn't settle in for the long conversation she had imagined. It is hard on us getting used to you, Mike, she said, leaving. It is hard on all of us. But I helped to bring you into the world, Mike, even before your mother did. I cupped your head in my hands. <clears throat> so I have maybe a right to tell you, we aren't as deeply keeled as you think we are. So don't let out too much sail to the wind, Mike. Don't let out too much sail to the wind. On land, a man can run the risk of being an individual. He can find his own way of cutting the turf. On land, a man can be himself with or against the traditional way. On the ocean, no. At nightfall, the moment four men step off the pier into their boat, the moment they fix their oars in their hole pins and start pulling, leaving their moorings, at that moment, whatever is individual and peculiar in them becomes submerged in a calm, collective, common rowing. Even if, out on the ocean, on a wild night, the man in the bows makes a bad decision, you will, till he recovers, row in with it. Because four men rowing together have some chance, whereas four men rowing at cross purposes have no chance at all. <clears throat> Manning the beam oars, Big Mike submerged himself in a common task. And maybe that's why regularly now he came to Mass, recognizing Jesus to be a good man at sea. He was willing to row in behind him. And so it was that the women knew him as they knew every other man by the sound of his footsteps on the gravel path. And something in those sounds, a sense of silence sown by them, reassured Ilo Lacey. It occurred in her, having talked to him one evening in his house, that maybe Big Mike was a holy man. But how could this be? How could a next-door neighbor of hers be any such thing? Neither in appearance or behavior did he resemble any of the saints she regularly prayed to. He didn't talk about holy things. And yet, when he talked about ordinary things, about tea or turf, it was like being at Mass. Could it be, she wondered, but only to herself, could it be that there is a kind of holiness Christianity has never recognized? The thought threatened her. That thought put an end to all such thoughts. She would stay with what she knew. She would stay with the Mass that Christ instituted and the priest celebrated. By the end of March, it was evident that Sarah Coyne was dying. She was dying hard, not willing to give in. She asked Big Mike to sit with her at night. Nine nights later, he was still ministering to her calmly in word and deed. In the end, Sarah died in peace. She had helped him to come into the world. He helped her leave it. And people were sure of it. At her wake and at her funeral, they were sure of it. They were sure that Big Mike had prepared her for whatever it was she would meet in eternity. And now it wasn't only Ilo Lacey who was threatened by strange thoughts. All over again, everyone was having to get used to Big Mike. Nor was that the end of it. Having cleaned the nets one morning, he told Ned Lavelle that he wanted a break, so he wouldn't be manning the Beemores that night. This wasn't upsetting news for Ned. For the past couple of years, his grandson, who had replaced Big Mike a few times, had been hoping for just such an opportunity. That evening, the women were aware of a vacancy, of something familiar not there, on the gravel path outside their doors, their doors to seaward. And again the next morning, it was by their absence that they were aware of Big Mike's footsteps. 
It was like a bereavement, Nora McGrail thought. It was like an angel fallen silent. One day, off and on all day, Ned Lavelle heard hammering up at Big Mike's house. Again the next day, a few times, he heard it. What now, he wondered. What's he up to now? Only one thing to do, he thought. I'll go and find out. You're not thinking, he said, seeing what was afoot. You're not thinking, are you, Mike, of going to sea in that one? I was thinking that maybe I might, Big Mike replied. Don't, Ned said. Don't go to sea in a boat as ill-omened as she is. It isn't hearsay, he said. I was there myself that day. I saw it myself. She was standing there, perfect and finished, a beautiful thing, proud of her. The boat right tapped her lightly on the right gunwale, and with a sudden frightening crack, she split from stem to stem, a bad sign, a warning. Your grandfather heeded it. He left her to rot. <coughs> People were at a loss what to think or do the evening Big Mike walked down to the pier and rowed himself out alone in an ill-omened boat into the ocean. Every door was next door that night, and houses three doors away, four doors away from their own door is where everyone was sitting, talking, trying to comprehend. Everyone wanted to know what everyone else was thinking. What was he up to? Whatever it was, he wasn't respecting the ocean. He was tempting the ocean. He was breaking the bond, the understanding between the people and the ocean. <coughs> Excuse me. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not tempt the ocean. Thou shalt not tempt the immensities beyond the headland. What else could it be? He didn't intend to come back. And now, after every tide, they would have to comb the foreshores looking for evidence of his drowning. At daybreak, they were waiting for the first boats to appear around the headland. Eagerly as they came, they counted them, 15, 16, 17, and yes, there it is, the 18th boat. They are all coming home. Big Mike is coming home. He came home the next morning. Morning after morning, he came home like someone who had all his wits about him. He cleaned his nets, talked, as he often would, about the drift and run of sea, and then went home. <clears throat> Whatever it was, it wasn't madness. Yet again, though, people were having to get used to him. Three or four months later, having cleaned them one morning, he put his nets in a bag and took them home with him. Ilo Lacey, who called to him, bringing eggs to him, later that morning saw them hanging up outside in his outhouse. Calling it a day, everyone said. Big Mike has called it a day. <clears throat> Even the rocks seemed to breathe a sigh of relief. And the women felt their prayers had been answered. They were glad. They wouldn't be coming home from the shore some morning with a washed up sock or shoe. <coughs> they had reckoned only with their own hopes because there it was again that evening, the sound of his footsteps, Big Mike going down to the sea. Three doors, four doors, five doors away from their own door, you'd find them again that night, the people talking. Gone out without nets. There were no two ways about it. The only question was, would it be classed as suicide? And if it was, where would they bury him? Given the currents, there's every chance that he'd be washed up on this or on one of the neighboring islands. But no, not yet. <coughs> In the morning, at first light, 18 boats came round the headland. Let him be now, Joseph Burke said. Let him be. We don't know at all what ails him. Madness people could understand. But this was worse than madness, more dangerous altogether than madness. Night after night, going out with no nets? His nets hung up in a sack outside his outhouse, and yet there he was, rowing himself out every evening, out wide around the breakers, out around the headlands into the ocean. For what? <coughs> there was no understanding it. As Mike Kane, doddering on two sticks, had advised them to do, they let him go. Even to pray for him now, some people felt was somehow not right. Even if it ended up in disaster, even if you were the one who came across the washed up shoe, so be it. Big Mike was gone beyond recall. Within himself, he was gone beyond the sound of the last foghorn, beyond the light of the last lighthouse. And yet, for anyone who looked at him more than passingly, there was very obviously a kind of sanctity in him. And for anyone who listened more than passingly, there was in the sound of his footsteps now a deep tranquility a sense, as it were, of journey's end. A man 
gone beyond any lifeline Christianity could throw to him. That's how it seemed. And yet he might be a holy man. Here on our island, it was a terrifying thought. God bless you, Big Mike, Mike Kane said, looking after him, going down to the sea one evening. God bless you, Big Mike. A great Ford came down over land and sea one night. Stevie Ridge went to his door and looked out. He heard nothing, and you'd smell nothing. He called back to his wife, even with the snout of a fox, you'd smell nothing tonight. <coughs> Julia Neck was Stevie's next door neighbor. Julia was blind, but Julia, but Julia believed. In the depths of her apron pocket, she had a rosary beads. Those beads were her stars. They were her constellations. It was in her apron pocket, pocket that Julia's firmament was. And in that firmament, there were 15 mysteries, five of them joyful, five of them sorrowful, and five of them glorious. Constellations to navigate by in time and eternity. But when Julia took them into her hand, below in the depths of her apron, apron pocket, she felt only darkness. <clears throat> It was like the darkness that was before the world was. Tonight, for the first time in her life, Julia had nothing to navigate by. Her faith was blind. Oceanward, also, the darkness was serious. Even if they could somehow shine out there tonight, the light of the human mind and the light of the human heart would be brighter extinguished. Instinctively, on a night like this, fishermen row into the deep, and that's what they did. Out there in the deep, there are no breakers or headlands against which the ocean might roll them. Something ahead of us, something ahead of us, the man in the bow called out. In unison, without thinking, all four rowers sheared away, away, away. What in God's name can it be, Ned Lavelle thought, a whale or what? And then out of nowhere, like a slip of the tongue it was, he heard himself saying, Big Mike or what? Big Mike out here? Could it, could it be possible that it is out into this great deep he comes? He called out, is that you, Big Mike? Is that you, Big Mike? <clears throat> and the answer came back, it is. It's me. It's Big Mike. How's the fishing, Mike? The fishing is good. The fishing is very good. And from far, far away, they heard him. All four of them heard him, Big Mike calling out, the fishing is good. The fishing is very good. The fishing, not fishing at all, is blessedness, is bliss. Eventually, there was light. To begin with, they couldn't determine whether it was the light of sunrise or of sunset. Hoping that it was sunrise, they rowed, but without much confidence in its direction. In the end, they found their bearings and rowed home, Big Mike and his boat alone rowing behind them. It was more than Ned Lavelle could take. He got up and went down to Big Mike's house. What does it mean, Mike? What in Christ's name does it mean? In the dark, last night, I called out asking you how the fishing was. And in your voice, there is no mistaking your voice, Big Mike. In your voice, all four of us hearing you, you answered, the fishing is good. The fishing is very good. The fishing, not fishing at all, is blessedness, is bliss. I looked in your boat moored below at the pier this morning, and there wasn't a fish scale in it, and your nets hung up. What are you up to, Big Mike? <clears throat> it's a long story, Ned. Living it or being lived by it, it was long. I wasn't long at sea when one night keeping watch before the mast I heard a sound. It wasn't an everyday sound, and it wasn't in my everyday hearing that I heard it. Hearing it, I knew that something at once wonderful and terrible had happened. All I could say about it is that ever so briefly, while it lasted, I was not in this world. Either my world had vanished, or my awareness of it had vanished, or maybe they had vanished together, and there it was, the sound, the first pure sound out of the divine silence. For fear of blasphemy, I'll say no more about it. I was never the same after that. The sailors sensed it. They said it was nerves. And I suppose outwardly anyway, it was nerves. For I had lost all sense of inner individual grounding, of grounding in selfhood. <clears throat> and I hadn't yet found grounding in God. Inwardly, I was in an awful no man's land or no man's void between ground lost and ground not yet found. During all those years, though, deep within me, I was a kind of praying, a kind of speechless praying I was, if you like, a dumbfounded state of prayer. And then at last, to give it a chance, I'd sometimes go inland, spending weeks on end <clears throat> in monasteries in India and China, <clears throat> in Hindu monasteries in India, and Taoist monasteries in China. But even in them, there wasn't the kind of silence I was seeking. And one day, in the Australian outback, an old medicine man advised me to go home. And that's why one evening after 30 years, there was smoke from my chimney again. From then on, it was like being Job. It was, it was like being Jonah. 
And like Job and like Jonah, I had to let God enact a parable on me. I had to become a living parable, a truth that God would make visible, be made visible in me. Night after night, alone in an unlucky boat, I rowed myself out, out wide around the breakers, out around the headland, into the ocean. Out there, night after night, I cast the net of my mind into the ocean of experience. Into it, I also cast the net of my heart. Every morning, hauling the net of my mind, I hoped that in it I would find the great creed, the great knowing, but I never did. Neither did I, hauling the net of my heart, find in it the great emotion, the great saving passion or rapture. In both nets, from time to time, I found marvels, but I didn't find final healing. Final healing isn't healing of the mind, nor is it healing of the heart. It is healing beyond, beyond them, into divine ground, divine ground within, divine ground below passion and love in the human heart, below knowing in the human mind. You know the rest. The net of my mind and the net of my heart hung up in a bag outside in my outhouse, and I rode myself out. And it's true, Ned. It is true. Out there in that divine dark, out there in that divine deep, the fishing is good. The fishing is very good. Out there in that divine dark, out there in that divine deep, the fishing, not fishing at all, is blessedness, is bliss. So <clears throat> I hope you enjoyed that story. <coughs> I'm getting over a cold, so I apologize for the coughing. I'm sure it was distracting, <clears throat> but I hope you were able to hang with it and receive the um, the beauty of that story. <clears throat> There's just a few reasons why that story moved me and I felt moved to share it. Um, one is that um, I find myself uh, constantly having to, like my mantra meditation practice, which is sort of the at the heart of bhakti yoga. Uh, I find that in that practice, when it when it feels like it's working, and I don't know what I mean, you know, by working, but when it when I feel <clears throat> like something is happening, um, there's always this beautiful feeling that whatever I thought about God or whatever I thought about divinity, that I've just gone beyond it. And one of the things that the Shastras tell us in the Bhakti Yoga tradition is that the experience of Bhakti, that is devotional love and communion with the divine, <clears throat> is something that is always going deeper, always expanding. Uh, there's no um, limit and that even God himself or itself or herself is always going beyond itself. That, that there's a, a constant uh, state of moving deeper or uh, more deeply and perhaps outward at the same time. <clears throat> what I love about this story is here you have like a guy from a local village in Ireland who spends many, many years away from that village and has some mystical experiences. And in those mystical experiences, he feels called to go back home. And he has no way of bringing back and putting into words what he learned by virtue of the different kinds of experiences that he had being abroad on the sea, the <clears throat> monasteries, and the profound silence that he encountered while at sea in that one particular mystical experience he recalls at the very end of the story. And so he doesn't know how to put it into words, <clears throat> uh, what he saw or how it impacted him. There's a sense that all the Christians have in the village that it's dangerous because it somehow goes beyond the God that they know. And yet in the story, he then feels compelled to take a boat out to sea without the purpose of fishing. So there's no purpose behind it. It's just about being out there in this immensity, in this deep and vast uh, ocean. And in, in, in doing that, <clears throat> somehow, in, in, in just going out and doing that, 
the minds of everyone locally are disturbed and in a sense forced to consider a divinity that is going beyond what their mind customs traditions culture and community can can hold um i think one of the main problems that people have with religion if i had to put it succinctly is that they don't find that religion is taking them beyond religion often enough i don't think it would be fair to say that it has to do it every single day but the cultural or traditional religious or spiritual communities and vehicles are not transcending themselves at a high enough rate or something like that. What I love about this story is <clears throat> the call to go to a divinity deeper than God, because it, it's not saying there is no God, but it's saying you have to, you have to somehow enter into this divine communion in a way that constantly goes beyond what you're tr what the way in which you're trying to capture and hold it i think bhakti yoga is exactly that because all of the most elevated states of sort of like bhakti samadhi if you i'm just using that kind of creatively are described as like krishna and radha going more deeply into each other at every moment than they've ever been before and it just keeps going <clears throat> i think it's very easy when religion, uh, just religious people or history or institutions present like the answer or the way or the thing um, without, without making sure that people have experiences of divinity that take us beyond what, you know, traditions can hold. So to me, what I love about bhakti <clears throat> is not the orthodoxy or the doctrines or the philosophy or the liturgy. It's the, it's the actual experience that I have when my japa is quote unquote working of going beyond the God that I thought I knew or understood or anything that I thought I knew or understood about myself or life. Or when I have that moment, um, you know, it, it feels like big Mike out, out in the boat. There's no purpose here. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not with the crew who's out fishing. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I'm doing something else. <laughs> you know? And um, <clears throat> I love at the end <clears throat> how honest Big Mike is, and uh, you know, you know, just, just. just um, this is why I love the the phrase, the title of the book too: "A Hut at the Edge of the Village." Uh, you know, many of us have had this experience of, of oh, I've, I've had some kind of mystical uh, event or experience. I try to come back to a group of people that know me and they all think that I'm strange. Some of them are attracted, worried. But this is it's really important that these people exist or that we have these experiences and go back and try to... Um, we don't just separate ourselves. Oh, I'm spiritual now, so then I just I leave the world behind. I love that he's called back to his community as well, and that he just has to show up and be that odd duck that lives in the hut at the edge of the village. So I hope you guys enjoyed that, and I, I my coughing and and so forth wasn't too much, and um, that you were also able to um, uh, that these reflections on the story are also valuable for you. So that's Bhakti Wednesday for today. Don't forget to pick up a copy of this book. I mean, the stories in this book are incredible. A Hut at the Edge of the Village by John Moriarty. Props to my um, my friend, Sean Nygaard, who's an astrologer, who's the one who actually turned me on to John uh, John's work in the first place. All right, that's what I've got for today. Happy Wednesday. Happy, happy Bhakti Wednesday, everybody. Hare Krishna.